The topic here is uh, the, uh, the role of sports in building a great city. We, there's uh, people out here who love Calgary, really committed to Calgary, and we want to explore a little bit what role does sports play in, uh, in the city. And let's start a little bit by talking about the qualitative, non-bottom line perspective, you know, the social value of sport. Ken, maybe I'll start with you. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you feel uh, in the non-economic sense? professional sport uh, really helps to build a community? Uh, we have a thing we call emotional equity. There's the financial equity, and we treat emotional equity the same way we do financial equity. There's debits and credits. You, you come to a city, you distinguish yourself, or perhaps not distinguish yourself, sometimes on the basis of performance. So if you, if you just took sports on the, on the pure competitive basis and said, if you win, people will like it, and if you lose, they'll be grumpy, or if you said, is there any actual value? And, and 15 years ago when I joined the company, I, I asked that question. You think you would have asked it before you joined, but I said, do, do sports actually matter? Does, it, does anybody really care about it? And it became very abundantly clear to me that people care very dearly. In fact, for some people, it is uh, the old metaphor about a religion. It's, it's unbelievable to me how uh, invested emotionally some people are. So I think that uh, if you've seen cities that don't have professional sports franchises or, or uh, amateur sports franchises and get them, or in the case of Winnipeg or Quebec, have them and lose them, you can have a real outpouring uh, of, of emotion about, uh, about their departure or about attracting them and that type of thing. So I think they're integral. I think they're just this, a piece of a great cultural fabric, and I think they're an important piece. Okay. Jody, what are your thoughts on... On that. that actually brings up a really good point, the difference between something that's important and something that's valuable. Um, what I've found from the academic perspective is when you look at cities and you study them, there's a lot of different methods and theories that are used. Um, but what you find overwhelmingly when you talk about arena projects and basic urban revitalization projects, the data and the studies tend to say that the trickle-down effects are simply not there. And you hear that a lot publicly as well. The thing that we're missing, though, and this is something that particularly affects me because I'm a social scientist, we tend not to focus on the things that are not quantifiable, so the intangible stuff. And as Ken said, how it makes you feel, that sense of pride you have. It's really hard to measure that feeling that you get from being a part of something. And when we can't measure those things, we tend to tuck them aside and not use them to evaluate projects or commodities like sport. So it's particularly troubling that when we do an assessment, it's generally focused on the economics and not on the sense of place, the sense of identity, and really what it brings to a city. If you go back and you think about the Red Mile, which for some people was a pejorative term, it was a great big party, <laughs> but what we heard a lot about was the galvanizing effect for the city. That is, neighbors who never talked to each other would come out and, and have that in common. People in elevators, ethnic groups that, that would uh, not uh, even talk to each other had that one simple, beautiful thing in common that was kind of that go flames, go thing. And I'm not touting the flames particularly, but if you can come together for a common, unimportant but valuable reason, it's, it's a good thing. I'm talking to Dr. Hiller here about the Olympics and the hangover of the Olympics way back from 88. We're still proud of that and we should be proud of that. And it, it, it had such a a wonderful effect. Economically, can you count it? Can you, can you add it up? I'm not sure, but it's valuable. That raises a good point, too. I mean, this is, um, the point of integration is something that's interesting. Uh, I don't look like your typical Manitoba prairie girl. It's kind of not what you expect, but that's, in fact, what I am. I grew up on the prairies. I learned how to skate outside on a pond. I froze to death, but I wanted to get back out there again the next day. Those are my roots, and that's what I remember. So when it came time to teach my daughter how to skate, we stuck her out on the lake and basically said, to use a term from dodgeball, if you can skate on a lake, you can skate anywhere. Those are the things that you know, bind our generations together, and it gives you this feeling that you belong somewhere. Coming from India to England to Canada, my parents had to adjust to a lot of different cultures. And when they were able to have those experiences and share them with people who had been longtime residents of Canada, it really made them feel like a part of something. 
and the Punjabi broadcast of Hockey Night in Canada, that's a great example. That is not what you expect to see when you're listening to a broadcast or watching something on television. But I'll tell you, what that broadcast has managed to do is take the generations of people who have come from Punjab and connect them together. So they can't watch cricket or go out and play kabaddi, but they can certainly now connect over hockey. So it's very important. I was in, invited, interestingly, over to uh, when the Sinuk people came to Calgary. I, I was invited and I said, well, why would you want to talk to somebody like me? And they said, well, we need to understand hockey. We need to understand, the. this was the Chinese contingent. We need to understand why it seems to be so important here, but they just didn't get it. So it was a wonderful and a, and a, and a great discussion, but an easy integration tool for them in terms of, and we weren't trying to sell them anything. We didn't even have anything to sell, unfortunately. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that it was a, a, a really intriguing conversation about how to integrate into our society and into our, our, our kind of way of life. And whether it's hockey or amateur sports or, or anything else, it, it, it can be a pretty, pretty cool tool. What's the social value of, uh, of community leadership, uh, heroes, if you will? What's, you know what, that's a good comment and a good question. I mean, there's a lot of kids who want to be hockey players when they grow up. There's a lot of kids that want to be football players. Um, something that's interesting to me is with the Roughnecks in town, a lot of kids have gotten into lacrosse that otherwise may not have gone down that road. So you can see that there's a role for professional sports to bring along amateur sport and introduce the world to a whole new way of being physically active. But you know, in terms of, of heroes and people that command attention, Sometimes we look at hockey players or football players and say, you know, they're, they're disconnected from me, and they're not the average person. But when they're not the average person, they have the ability to do things that, you know, average people like me can't do. I'm going to use the example of Sheldon Kennedy. He took a very bold step and talked about something that was very painful, and he brought about a cause that people weren't willing to talk about, to the point where we have renamed our Child Advocacy Center after him. It's a very brave thing to do, it's a very big thing to do, and because he had that attention, he could make it an issue that we all wanted to talk about. I'll give you two odd examples. One is uh, a woman named Pat. She was at the hospice, and we get a call from the hospice from time to time. There are fans up there, and they said, gee, could a player come? And sometimes they can, and sometimes they can't. So I'm a poor substitute for a player, but I went to meet <laughs> Pat and apologized that it was me and not Mika Kippersaw. And, uh, she was very sick, and she had a Flames watch on, and she had a jersey on. She did not want to talk about life. She wanted to talk about goals, and she wanted to talk about stops. She just wanted to take a respite from her respite, and she died about uh, four days later. It was a very touching, very emotional uh, situation, but it was a beautiful example of, of again, the, the value, and, but not the, un, the, not the importance. The other thing is a little thing we call reading, give it a shot. It's, it's amazing. So we go to these schools, we've gone for years, the guys go in, Harvey the Hound goes in, and, and uh, it's an elementary school, or two, or three of them, and kids get a bookmark for every book they read. At the end of the year, like clockwork, Tearfield parents come to a game, and uh, they come up to me, and they hug me, and they say, I, I get far too much credit, and, and shouldn't, but um, the program should, and say, you know what, my kid read 15 books. My kid hasn't read 15 books in five years but simply because of that kind of that, that hero thing and getting a simple bookmark, uh, it, it has a dramatic social impact uh, when it can be used for good. So here's a question, I'm gonna put it to Jody first. Does professional sports pay? <coughs> like is the economy better off because we have professional sports? You know, once again, the common approach, um, particularly from a political economy perspective, and this is the thing that's a little bit interesting, political economists, when they look at cities, they talk about cities being contested spaces, and they talk about cities being a source of conflict and a site of conflict. There's different people that want to use land in cities for different reasons, and the conflict goes on, and ultimately the voice that has the most power carries the day, and their vision comes to light. But Again, what the political economists are not examining is how the use value of a commodity impacts people. Again, because it's hard to measure. How do you measure how something makes you feel? How do you measure the benefits that are intangible and not in dollars and cents? Obviously, something has to have a very sound financial case behind it. You need to have a solid business case. But you know, there's also other things, like where we sit on a global stage. We are no longer cities that are the site of production. 
We don't have factories as the icon of the city. The icon of the city is much different now. We're in a symbolic economy where we are a consumption place. People come to cities to consume experiences. And some of those experiences happen to be based on sport. Others are based on culture. How do you put a value around that? Those in economic development will say that it's critical to have those opportunities in a city, but they're difficult to measure. But lots of people think, I mean, we are a resource-based, or commodity-based uh, economy, for sure. Uh, and we need to shift to this human capital economy. That's what we really are. I'm always amused by the question whether or not, I mean, we are a business. Uh, we will, we will uh, have a payroll tonight, uh, when Nashville is here, and I hope you're all there tonight. Um, we will have uh, 1,500 people working at that game. We'll have uh, $100 million worth of payroll on the ice and all of whom pay taxes. Uh, they will consume goods that are uh, manufactured and built and, and, uh, and created in our province and, and in other places. So um, uh, the amusing part to me is we're, we're the same as the rest of you that are running your businesses. This, this is a business. It has the social element that we're talking about. It has the civic pride element. But it's also it's business. Now, nobody should care about the business part. We don't even want people to care about the business part. We just want you to have some fun. Okay, so if we put together sort of the social side of it, the economic side of it, what we're really, uh, what I'm really curious about is uh, can professional sport help make a city a great city? You know, what are the components that make a city great and uh, is professional sport a key component of that? I'll throw it out. Well, you know what? It depends on who you talk to. And if you look at evaluations of what makes a city great, we've all seen um, the indices that come out. You know, the world's happiest city, the world's cleanest city, uh, the world's most entrepreneurial city. All of those measurements are created by somebody. And they're variables that are measured that someone decided are significant and important. To date, I have not seen an index that says the world's sportiest city, but it's certainly possible. And what if we turn the argument on its head? What if we talk about the role that sports plays in building a healthier city, in invigorating people to get out there and be active and have healthier lifestyles? We talk a lot about smart cities and walkability, but what's the role that sport has to play in encouraging people to be more active and be healthier? Um, I think that's really, really critical. I think the inspiration and the motivation, the education that we brought to that kind of that reading program, we're trying to do that with health. We're experimenting. We're on a two-year experiment to see if we can have an impact on uh, motivating, inspiring, and educating people to health and wellness. We know that we need prevention medicine here. We've got to keep healthier people out of the health system. The health system is in a difficult situation. We think that we might be able to play a pretty critical role in that, and we're, and we're looking forward to it. So coming in, uh, in March, we're going to have our second fair. It's a fairly small thing, but we're looking to kind of build that and see if that can be a, a pillar of, of, of really what we're trying to do. But in terms of that whole city building, uh, if you have a team, does that make your city any different? Well, you have an opera, you have a zoo, you have a heritage park, you have a, we have a beautiful new international airport. We have a new library that's coming here. Those are all pieces of the puzzle, every one of them. One of them uh, singularly is not necessarily more important than the other, but I think when you put them together, you come up with something great. But here's the question. Does anybody here think that we would be better off uh, if we weren't here? Would, would that make us a better city? Uh, take, the, take the obverse. Uh, Fifteen years ago, things were very challenging. We had about 9,000 people coming, and I was talking to a fellow, and he said, you know what, Ken, hockey's dead. People are in Palm Springs, people are elsewhere, it's, it's over. And I said, well, you know what, you've convinced me. I'm going to go back and tell our owners, we should get out of town. He said, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That's not what I meant. So, so the easy question is, are we better off with it or better off without it? How about um, sense of place and uh, the events and uh, an ability to congregate and to celebrate? How important is... Uh, is sport in building great community and great city from that perspective? Well, let's use the Red Mile example again. I mean, when the playoffs were on, people were spilling out into the streets, just excited to be a part of something. There's an energy there. There's a passion for being part of a great thing. 
And I mean, it didn't matter if you were a diehard fan or just somebody that became a fan because you were watching the playoffs. Frankly, you didn't even really have to like hockey. It was just a chance to be around other people that were excited about being in the same place. And we talk about how great cities are vibrant and they have a strong public realm. And the public realm is a place where people want to gather and come together. Sport allows you to do that. I mean, one of the other big things that's often mentioned is it's a game of wealthy people. Professional sports is for the wealthy, it's not for the common person. I would say that we need to think about that carefully. And the great equalizer has been television. Television, our smartphones, those types of things allow you to take in that experience no matter where you are. You don't have to be in the stadium or the arena to take in the game. You can be at your local pub, you can be in your home, you can be hanging out with whoever, wherever, but you're sharing that same sense of pride and that feeling that you belong to something bigger than just you. We're all looking for something somewhere to cheer for. Um, it could be politically, it could be economically, it could be socially or, or anything else. Uh, the simple beauty of sports is that it, 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 you know what, we can hate Edmonton and the Oilers because we should, but we need to, as cities, economically, we need to work together and create a great province. So, so this is a nice, uh, a nice tributary where we can go off and, and, and just, it's not a 10 cent movie in the depression by any means, but it's a nice tributary where we can go off and, and take two or three hours. Our view is uh, you don't have to spend a penny to be a Flames fan or a Roughnecks fan or a Stampeders fan, just, just cheer. That's all. Uh, we're good with that. We're fine with that. And if that makes you feel better, if that makes your city feel better, if, if that's a role model for your kids or, or, or Pat at the hospice or anything else, then, then that's a good thing. Well, and Lauren and I were having a chat before uh, we got up here, and we were talking about the fact that, you know, the economy is down, times look a little bit tough, liquor sales are up. Apparently, uh, checkouts at the library are up. Maybe we just need to get away for a couple of hours, for a couple of minutes, and just think about something different other than the doom and gloom that's supposedly upon us. If you read the newspapers every day, it's a little bit depressing. This gives you a little bit of a respite. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, what about the dark side? Is it a good thing or a bad thing that in Europe, uh, you know, they'll have a, a football game and they'll be fighting in the stands and... Uh, like, is the exuberance too much sometimes, or is it a good thing? Jim, is that really a question? <laughs> That's a really bad thing. Um, actually, one of the issues for us, and on all sports, listen, 1.8 million people, uh, we're the largest gathering place in southern Alberta, maybe in all of Alberta. 1.8 million people come through there. They come through there to have fun. They come through there and sometimes have more fun than they necessarily should. Alcohol management, profanity actually, is an issue that we have to deal with all the time. That we have to manage. So the exuberance, uh, when in as in anything, when it gets to the extremes, it's not good, and and that's part of our role. We need to manage that, and we need to uh, have people on, have some common sense about that. And and while those are issues for us, they don't dominate us. We have uh, more happy uh, customers than not. How about from your perspective as a sociologist, sort of the tribal uh, component of it, or or uh, the collective interest. Um, what are your thoughts on that in well, sport? It's interesting. When we talk about sport and what it brings to a community and what it means to um, an urban center, it's exactly your point. People get so riled up and so passionate about cheering for their team that they, they can't scale it back enough to understand that you've got to tone it down a bit. So clearly that passion is there. People do care and it does bring them together. But you know, you, you do have to have those checks and balances in place. And, it's interesting, um, Murray Ord and I were talking about the role of sport in smaller centers. And is it as important? Is it as important in a smaller city as it is in a larger urban center? And I think the difference is when you only have one thing in a city to hang on to, and it's your hockey team or your football team, right? You're gonna cheer for that team, and you're gonna cheer hard, and you'll probably have more civic boosters backing that particular commodity, cultural commodity, if you will. If you get into a bigger center, even when you're in Calgary, which isn't always assumed to be a global city, we've got a lot of different options competing, but look at the people around Calgary who don't have anything in their towns, and they're die-hard fans of the Hitmen or the Stamps. The city is providing them with something that they otherwise wouldn't have. So the city has a larger role to play. It's not just about your boundaries. You're reaching out across the hinterland, if you will, and you're reaching out to those people who used to live here that went away. 
uh, those people that were born here and still say that they belong to Calgary. It binds people together. If, you're, uh, if you overdo sports like anything else, just get a life. I mean, the, it's, it, it's not that important. Do not physically touch somebody. Do not swear at somebody. Don't, don't get drunk and do dumb things. Sports isn't that important. It's, it's only ever meant to be fun. And we need to really understand that. You can talk about the business of sports and, and all of those aspects, and they're valuable, and we're, we're, we're a human capital a business in a, in a commodity-based environment, but, but it's, uh, it's, this is entertainment. This is for fun. Uh, if you, I grew up, despite my very urbane and sophisticated manner, I grew up in a small uh, Saskatchewan farming community. That's a joke, by the way. Um, and uh, sports was a big deal. I mean, we had a rink. It was too cold to skate outside, so we had a covered rink, all those rinks that were built in the prairies in the 30s and 40s. And, and it was a central tenet. And you go to Medicine Hat or you go to Lethbridge or you go to Red Deer, it's the same thing. It's, 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 as you said here, there's just more choices. It's just a little bigger, a little on a grander scale. But, but sports is an integral part of society uh, and can be a very powerful and valuable tool everywhere, little towns, big cities, and, and in the world. I mean, I grew up in Brandon, Manitoba. So when the hitmen, come to, when the hitmen are here and the Wheat Kings come to town, um, that's pretty exciting. Might not be exciting for all y'all, but I think it's a great time. And anyone that's here from Brandon, we all get together and we go to the game and we take our kids along with us and we reminisce about the good old days and we talk about, oh, do you remember when the Huttons had billets and those billets went on to play in the NHL? It just, you know what, it gives you a chance to connect with people and you tell your stories and it weaves into the fabric of your life. So yes, it is valuable. Can you put a dollar value on it? That's really tough to do. In terms of the, um, you know, the, the city as a structure, and um, there's such a movement to um, uh, entertainment and sports being combined together and saving downtowns that are kind of dead. Um, is, is that really a valid way to try and uh, keep cities alive? And I'm thinking of uh, Detroit or Phoenix or wherever. I'm going to say, go to Detroit, go to Edmonton. If you haven't been to Edmonton yeah. and haven't seen what they've done to that downtown, it is amazing. Our little pitch here for Calgary Next, which has uh, been fun and perhaps entertaining for some of you, and uh, <laughs> maybe even challenging for others, but um, the fact of the matter is, is, is our sales pitch is over. When they open that building in Edmonton, it is going to be phenomenal. It's gonna be great for that city. Uh, people here are going to go there to go to that building and to see cultural events and sporting events. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Detroit, uh, the, the formerly bankrupt city of Detroit is depending singularly on, uh, on the Detroit Red Wings and the Illich family for what they're about to do in downtown Detroit. Tampa Bay, Los Angeles, uh, Buffalo. Uh, at one of our recent Board of Governors meetings, there was a presentation on on some of the projects and it became uh, pretty evident that one of the most transformative uh, um, issues in North American cities is sports. So you're not just building a stadium anymore, or building an arena, you're actually transforming cities. In some cases, revitalizing them, some cases, saving decrepit urban blight, um, and in other cases, enhancing something uh, as we're trying to do here. So it's a powerful, powerful tool in that respect. And that's just the point. It's a tool. It's a piece of the larger puzzle. Sport itself will not save any city. Sport as a tool to encourage urban revitalization and to allow us to change the way a community looks and really bring about strong mixed use, it's a great element. Is it an end in and of itself? Absolutely not. It needs to work with the other pieces that you need to make either a project viable or a city viable. So when we talk about Calgary Next, um, one of the things that I'd like to point out is we've got some really good feasibility studies going on right now. We've got people who developed East Village checking out West Village to see if it's the appropriate site, and we don't have all the facts yet. We need to wait for the information to come in. We need to wait for the decision makers to congregate and talk about what that looks like. I think it's premature to weigh in and say, yes, it's good, no, it's bad, when the discussion is yet to be had. Yeah, that uh, I've said often, the, the wrong question is always asked, and I probably shouldn't even introduce this to this dialogue here, but, but taxpayers' money for millionaires and billionaires. That's, that is so far off in terms of the question. The question is, is this good for our city or not? 
And you all should decide that. You should look at it, you should understand it, you should, you should get informed about the subject, and you should come to your own conclusions and you can say, hey, I think this is great for our city, or, or I think it's a detraction, or I think it's negative, and, and you, should, you should make that decision. And we're good with that. We just, we're just rational, logical people who, uh, who thank goodness for our ownership group, who are heavily invested in our city here, emotionally and socially and philanthropically and, and in business and as employers have said, hey, we'd, we'd like to try and build a little bit of a legacy here. I'm not going to take today to try and convince anybody of anything, but it's, uh, let, let's make sure we ask the right questions for sure. Okay, so I'm going to um, introduce uh, the audience for questions. So if you have a question, put up your hand. But while they're uh, thinking about their next great question, I'm going to ask uh, Jody and Ken one last question. So sport can really build the city, can uh, create a lot of community spirit. Does that drive us down uh, the road of, uh, of diversity or, or does it narrow us to uh, more homogeneity? What are your thoughts on that in terms of the overall fabric of, of the community? I think it's gonna drive us towards diversity. I mean, we're already seeing how sport brings diverse groups together and I think we're diversifying sport itself. And we're starting to look at it as something more than uh, just something to watch. Sport has become more than just entertainment. It's become a lifestyle. It's become you know, a way that we raise our kids. If you think about your school system and your kids being uh, you know, exposed to sport in school and just general activity, I don't know how many of you are parents in the room, but do you ever get those forms coming home where you have to track your kids' activity for a week or a month? Dear God, those are horrible to fill in, but they're important. It makes you think. Have they moved past the, uh, you know, the video games and are they outside doing something significant, something that's going to get them some exercise? Sports become that motivator for us to ensure that we're leading those healthy lives. And I think sport has a very diverse role to play. You talked about diversity. It has a diverse role to play in terms of the entertainment value it offers, the economic value it offers, and the health value that it offers as well. I think if it were limited, I think if it were just expensive tickets for people that could afford them, it, it could have the potential for what you've got, but it's anything but that. Because as I said, you don't have to spend any money to, to, to be involved or, or to be a fan or, 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 or just to watch. But we have a thing, uh, our junior team has a lunar game, and it was designed specifically and directly to appeal to, uh, to uh, part of the Asian community. And they have so much fun, and they've brought so much to us. Yeah. that's been interesting and it's it's a great event and uh, it's it's you know people that study religion actually end up knowing more about religion than people that are born to it <laughs> yes. people that actually come and study sports actually learn more about it than the than the 45 year old pals of mine the young guys uh, who think they know all of it i didn't know you knew any 45 year olds <laughs> but yeah <laughs> i guess i don't <laughs> uh questions from the audience just hold up your hand and there is uh, i see one here one here and so, oh, uh, Bob Brown. Ken, uh, I think there, I don't think there's any question about the value of sports to the community, but uh, I think maybe you've just picked the wrong location. Uh, if, you, if you can't build it in combination with a stampede, then I think you should look at the university. And if uh, generational uh, social contact is important, that's a great place to be. And uh, taking down McMahon and putting a field house up at the university on the baseball diamonds up there uh, with a, with a uh, LRT station right there, I think that's the place you want to go. And, uh, and I, think, I think that you get a lot of support for that. And I know Elizabeth has a little bit of money for a field house. So anyways, uh, you should try it, I think. In the great uh, words of uh, the great Norman Schwarzkopf, um, I can answer questions, but I can't answer statements. Um, that sounded more like a statement than a question. But I think there's lots of ways to be right, Bob. Uh, we've chosen this, and frankly, if there are competing ideas and, and different places and different ways to look at that, we would fully expect that they would come forward. And frankly, I think they are going to come forward. And they will compete, and we will discuss them, and we'll, we'll talk about it. There's lots of ways to be right on this. And that's yeah. something that I want to weigh in on as sure. well, is, and, and I think this sometimes gets um, a little bit overshadowed. We've got really strong administration team at the city, and we've got really sure. strong council at the city. And they're all, are we moving? Yeah, well, no, no, we, just, <laughs> okay. we're, we don't want Ken to fall off, and uh, he wants to be dominating, so he's standing. 
<laughs> he's, he's nervous about what you're going to say. So. <laughs> We've got a strong administration and council at the city. They understand how cities work, and they want Calgary to be as great as it can be. So I'm sure that they will be looking at all of those other options, and I'm sure they're going to weigh the pros and cons of different sites. And again, those conversations are still happening. So thanks for your idea. Let's see where it goes. Yeah, I, I've got a question for Jody. Uh, have you seen any studies that indicate uh, or, or discuss whether there's a correlation between how great a city is and the degree to which it invests uh, public funds in sports? You know, those studies are out there, and the thing that happens is the measure of greatness is the issue. So depending on how you operationalize what greatness means, the studies will tell you different things. I think the social scientists have let us down, myself being one of them, where we haven't come up with the proper measures to indicate what makes a city great. If you were going to talk about the fact that the city is healthier, there's less of a drain on the healthcare system, or people are happier, whatever it happens to be, there may be a correlation. But if you're only looking at the number of jobs that are created or any of those other trickle-down effects, the literature is indicating that those projects sometimes don't offer those benefits. So my response is, I don't think we're measuring the variables the way we should be. There's a lot of studies that look at the difference between public investment and private investment, and all of the research indicates that when it's a strong, healthy partnership between the two, that's when it works the best, because everyone's got some skin in the game. But achieving that balance is the trickiest thing to do. We hear a lot of talk about tax inc increment financing, community revitalization levies. Those things only work if you've got a strong source for them. So those are all very tricky and complicated aspects that need to be considered. So in our, in our deliberations, in our project, we've looked at those and um, the CRL, the Community Revitalization Levy, it actually has to work. You can't just throw it up there and say, well, I hope something will happen. Somebody actually has to build a hotel or build an office tower, uh, build a condo, create an environment that has to be there. That's the real question. The real question isn't whether you should have a CRL. The question is the efficacy of the CRL. Will somebody actually, in this city, in this economy, will they actually build something? Now, we think we can be a catalyst and we can help them do that, but we need to find that out. If we can, great. If we can't, then we, we got a problem. Okay, we have a question over here. We've got the Saddle Dome and you talked about the Red Mile and, and of course on 17th Ave, that's had a huge impact, I would think, economically. What do you see with what's being proposed and what it might do to what exists as well as what might be? Really good question. If I may be permitted to take a, uh, take a run at it. We're, we, uh, the Red Mile was organic. Uh, it happened, uh, nobody planned that, there was no promotion, nobody got together and said let's see if we can get 20 or 30 or 40,000 people to congregate and, and do things downtown. Um, specifically in our project, we said we're not building an entertainment district. There'll be a bar, there'll be a restaurant, there'll be more than one, but we need a live, work, play environment if you build an entertainment district, that's what you're going to get. So um, I don't know if there will ever be another Red Mile uh, or not. I think that might have been a, a cultural phenomenon that grew out of a spontaneous sort of, sort of eruption. The, the Saddle Dome itself, we have a study that's going on right now that we have, uh, we're involved with, uh, commissioned to determine its best and highest repurpose or whether it should be repurposed at all, whether it should continue to exist or not. And that's a bit of a touchy subject, of course, because it's an iconic uh, a piece of our, our downtown uh, skyline. But um, we'll come to, to a logical conclusion on that. And again, we can't, we're not sneaking in here trying to do anything. We're, we're going to tell everybody everything about what we're trying to do, and, and it'll make sense to you, or it won't. Uh, my guess is it probably will make sense. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. But. Do you have other questions? Now my kids are uh, into sports, and I'm a big proponent of that. I'm a big Stamps fan. But also I see alcoholism, and uh, I see sexism in sports. Um, I see uh, public agencies that are starved for funding to treat uh, these kinds of things. And I just wonder you know, how, how I reconcile it or how our society reconciles the value of sport and uh, things like uh, the alcoholism, gambling, um, concussions we're, we're facing as well. How, how, what kind of decisions can I make and, and how does public money get funneled where? Well, we spend, we have a run rate of about three or four million dollars in our foundation, all of which we direct to 
a number of different things. One of our sort of signature pieces was the, the children's pediatric hospice at the children's hospital. It's kind of the most notable one, but, but we spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of research in all of those areas. Uh, alcoholism and drug abuse and those issues are not uh, uh, sports issues. They're not, they're not uh, relegated only to sports. They're in every part of society. My guess is uh, they're, more, they're more highlighted in our business and, and, and uh, I th you just saw a kid uh, in the U.S. got suspended for 20 games and somebody might say, well, what difference does that make? We take those things very seriously. I think Sheldon Kennedy's work is the greatest example of the power and the value of reconciling um, those issues. His problem that that advocacy center is trying to solve was created in sports. And, and ironically now he and, uh, and sports, including ourselves and others that support it, are trying to, trying to deal with that. These issues are everywhere. We know that. We can't, we can't pretend that they're not. We don't hide them. We need to highlight them and we need to help work through them for our purposes and for all society purposes. And if we can have a, make a dent in that, I think that's a noble, noble thing for us to do. Jody, do you want to win? I'd just like to add to that too. One of the things that we talk about is gender imbalance in sport, and you talked about sexism. Um, you know, unless we as parents and members of the community step up and change that balance, it's not going to do it on its own. But you have to remember that the profile that professional athletes have also helps tip those scales. Um, I remember when, oh, I think her name was Manon Rion, when she played with, was it the Sharks? Uh, yep. uh, it was in Florida. In Florida? Okay. Yep. So she was a goalie and, you know, people say it's a pop culture tidbit of trivia, but really it impacted a lot of young girls. They suddenly wanted to go out and play hockey because they knew they could do it. We've got lots of girls in hockey now. We've got women in hockey. We've got women broadcasters. When you watch Sportsnet, when you watch broadcasting of any kind of sport, you've got women weighing in. And that's because someone said, hey, there's a problem, there's an imbalance, we're gonna do something about it. It's important to do it at your family level, at your community level, but what the professional athlete can do is broadcast it more widely. And that's why you see a lot of the social issues broadcast more widely as well. They don't belong only to sport, but maybe someone can step up and profile them and try to make that change happen. If you think of Brian Burke's work on, in, with the gay community and, and in terms of his openness and receptiveness and being really a spokesman for that, you think of Sheldon's work, you think of other players, where almost all of our players have uh, an initiative or a cause. It's not for public relations. If it were, you'd know about them. But they do these things very quietly and it's, it's really, really important and valuable work, we think. That's great. Uh, Nuveen? You... Great. Um, given that we've all been gathered here by the University of Calgary or through the Haskane Hour. And a lot of this conversation has focused on professional sports as city building. Um, and as someone with perhaps a stronger US-based experience with regard to the city building aspect of college sports, I'm wondering if you can comment within this Canadian or Alberta context, what aspect the college experience plays in city building, if at all? Does that, has anyone ever heard of the Dillon Panthers? Anybody watch Friday Night Lights? Okay, maybe I'm the only one that does. But <laughs> that's a great example of how the U.S., just the whole U.S. experience is completely different. People go to high school games and then they go to college games and you know the state game is a big thing. It's really big down there when it comes to football. When it comes to Canada and it comes to our universities and our colleges and the role that they play in city building as well, I think it's significant to note that kids and their parents are looking at the city that their child is choosing to go to. They're looking not only at the school, but they're looking at the city as an opportunity for the rest of the family. So absolutely, there's a role to play when it comes to university level sports translating into something that is bigger for a family that's choosing to relocate there. I wish university sports were bigger in Canada. If you think of the Crochelle Classic, which we just yeah, yeah. had, which was phenomenal. I think we had 15,000 yeah. people at the Scotiabank Cell down there to watch uh, Mount Royal and, and the UFC men's and, <laughs> <laughs> men's, men's and women's teams. That was really born of a, of a casual conversation that I was having with, uh, with David Doherty. He said, you know, we're, we play this thing. I said, well, why don't you play it here? First year was a few thousand. It, now it's grown to be a wonderful, wonderful event. 
If you look at the Borden letter, Gervais, Doug Mitchell's work on CIAU athletes and acknowledging them across Canada, I think there's, I think they're really valuable. I think they're really important. That's easy to say, but I think we need to do more work to, to highlight them. And it would be, it would be nice if more people watched them. Frankly, if they had a greater audience. By the way, where where is the next great quarterback come from? Just Andrew Buckley. <laughs> yes, our Dino boy. Uh, listen, I think the Dinos do a great job. I think I think yeah. I think university sports is really important. Fully half of our junior hockey team members end up in university teams. And many of them wow. are on your team as we speak. So we, we have a powerful investment and a, and a positive view about that for sure. That's good. And, and all that. amateur sports. I mean, we probably are one of the most dominant uh, providers of support either financially, directly, or, or indirectly of amateur sport in, uh, in the city. And I'm, happily I'm, so. Not sure, but I think we just bagged a new donation, so that was great, uh, Guy. You know, I'm a huge uh, proponent of what you want to do with Calgary Next, and hockey's the only way I get through the winter. Um, I just thought you obviously have studied what's happened in Edmonton, and you know, you made comment on what that's going to do for that city. I just wondered in, if you could put some context as to how long that took and where you think we are in the Calgary next cycle as to actually bringing this to fruition? I don't want to derail this wonderful conversation because it's more broadly based than, than what we're talking about there, but that, they were about eight or nine years in the process. Uh, we're, we're, we're into more years of work on this. It'd be nice if we could, uh, I see uh, Councillor uh, Woolley here, if we could wrap this up in a, in a few months, but I doubt that we'll be able to do that. Nor should we expect to, um, to, expect to be that expedient, because it's a very big deal. It's a billion dollars. We, we need to get it right. We need to make sure it's in the right place and, and do the right thing. So it's going to take some time, and we have time. We're all right. One of the things that I'll offer too is, um, you know, and Ken, not to disagree with you, but I think one of the things we need to do is examine that arena project and really look at how the CRL worked in that case and what are the types of uh, different stakeholders that came together on that one. And I'll throw this out to the students that are in the room, the students of real estate studies that are here. Take a look at how that project was done and then take a look at how this project is being proposed and see what the pros and cons are of both of them and see what the learnings are. You've got a very recent, very local example. So let's take advantage of that and maybe you can provide some informed opinion on which way we may want to go in Calgary. For the record, we'll take their deal. <laughs> I've been here for about three years and I've kind of learned the fanaticism of hockey in this part of the world and how Canadians identify themselves with hockey in quite the most extraordinary way which actually um, spans all boundaries and it means a lot to people. It's not dissimilar to actually the way the All Blacks and New Zealand identify themselves with rugby and, and to them, you know, if they don't win the Rugby World Cup, it is literally the end of the world. And uh, I felt this in 2010, um, I definitely felt it very tangibly in 2014, so I know the importance of sport and ice hockey. However, maybe you may be missing a trick here, because the biggest sport in the world is, is soccer. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna really look at the economic value and benefit across sport in a multi-sport environment, then maybe it'd be worth considering the, the impact of a soccer um, concept in Calgary, um, which would then put Calgary on a global map in terms of interest. And I think, if, I, I think it's worth exploring, I don't know what you have done, is, is where, where there have been franchises in, in that emergent sport in North America. Let's face it, it's, it's relatively immature compared to football, and understandably so, given the social and cultural context of college sport and high school sport in, in, in America. Um, but have you looked at how part of the project in the city building, the way soccer, which is, which the women, frankly, in Canada are better than the men, let's face it, so you know, you can rebalance the, the sort of the, the gender politics through that particular approach. There are lots of aspects of this you may want to consider. But have you looked at soccer as part of, a, um, as part of the mix and then the economic, social, um, reputational value that that would actually bring to Calgary in, in lovely Western Canada. 
you may know this or you may not, in order to have a World Cup, in order to host a World Cup, you have to have a domestic soccer league. There is no domestic soccer league in Canada. That's what we actually need is a domestic soccer league. To contemplate NASL or MLS, which we have looked at, uh, MLS is a massive undertaking, hundreds of millions of dollars to get a franchise and, uh, and then even more to, to, to try and operate it. So I think we're a long way away from an MLS or an NASL, but I think we're closer to a domestic league and I think it would fit nicely within CFL kind of environs and I'm going to get in trouble here, somebody don't tweet this one, but, <laughs> but there is discussion going on about a domestic soccer league and, and I think it has merit whether or not the city could handle another professional franchise in terms of uh, audience and all of that. Uh, we've studied, we think it's not quite large enough for that yet, but it will be at some point. There will be uh, professional soccer in Calgary in the next 20 years, is my guess. And it takes time to build that critical mass of people who will come out to a game. It's one thing to go and play soccer and have your kids enrolled in their community soccer clubs. It's another to vest a lot of time and interest in a, in a franchise. So I think it takes time. It's reaching that point where Canadians, frankly, are getting more and more interested. But do they view it as an entertainment type sport yet? That remains to be seen.